So that is why I'm so proud to introduce to you the next Vice President of the United States, my fellow lawyer, a brilliant scientist, technologist, a fierce warrior mom, Nicole Shanahan. More on that later, but first, the New York judge overseeing Trump's Stormy Daniels hush money case has placed a gag order over the former president. The trial is set to begin in mid-April, and the judge's decision echoes a gag order put in place in Washington, D.C.'s election interference criminal case. The hush money case would be the first criminal trial for the former president and also the first criminal trial for any former president. Joining me now with the latest is The Hill's Julia Manchester. Julia, will Trump respect the gag order? <laughs> Kevin, that's a good question because we know that he has an always respected gag orders. And we know that with these legal cases against him, they're really getting him fired up. And he likes to talk about them. In fact, it's part of his campaign strategy to really rev up his base, make them excited. So we'll see if he respects that gag order. Um, we know that Donald Trump normally only listens to one person, Donald Trump, but I'm sure his attorneys are pushing him to respect it for now. Well, when you look at the political implications of the this, Julie. Uh, we saw this from the Decision Desk HQ analysis piece just earlier this week. They were looking at the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll. Uh, Biden's closed the gap in the battleground states, but if you look specifically at Georgia, he's actually expanded his lead. Trump has in Georgia. Of course, that's the home of the other election interference case. So to your point, it is mobilizing the base in some states, but in more moderate states, it's hurting them, no? No, oh, absolutely. And Georgia is so interesting to me, Kevin, this cycle, because remember in 2020 and 2022, when Senator Raphael Warnock was running for a re-election, um, you know, Georgia was, you know, used to be a traditionally red state, really turned purple, appeared to be leaning blue. And we knew that Democrats wanted to keep up that momentum to make sure that their key constitu constituencies in the suburbs, as well as the African-American vote, which is very strong there, to make sure that they came out. But it seems to in Georgia that that is weakening. Though I will say, looking at the Southeast in general, you have Georgia, but another state that I think is, you know, we hear it talked about a little bit in terms of swing states, but I think it's a little under the radar is North Carolina. Um, I think yeah. North Carolina has the, um, you know, ab ability this time around or this cycle to really be a key decider really in the election. No, I think you're absolutely correct, especially when you go into some uh, suburban Durham, for example, uh, and some of the there's more swing counties uh, that are typically more moderate, but we're going to see how they go. Uh, absolutely great analysis on North Carolina. Switching back to Trump's businesses for a second, we talked about the shoes a couple of weeks ago, Trump selling shoes for his campaign. Now he's selling Bibles for $59.99. Yeah, it's uh, it's Holy Week, um, you know, just before Easter and Trump is selling Bibles, it seems like he's trying to re really capitalize on this merchandise game, really trying to push that going forward. You, you mentioned the shoes, now the Bibles. We know that he has a pretty firm support base among evangelicals, but I don't really see what this does for him in the long term. I think this is just kind of another business venture, and it's a little eye-catching just because it's a Bible. Well, the Bible is the number one book ever sold uh, in the history of books uh, um on planet Earth. Uh, but here's what Liz Cheney posted on X. She said, quote, Happy Holy Week, Donald. Instead of selling Bibles, you should probably buy one and read it, including Exodus ch uh, uh, chapter 20, verse 14. Thou shalt not commit adultery. So I will leave that for the <laughs> comment section and not engage in any more of that topic. But it really does look like, to your point, Julia, that uh, Trump's really almost turning the courtroom into a reality uh, show uh, and, and really kind of leveraging his ability to kind of make a lot of TV moments or digital first moments uh, with these trials, no? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, it, you know, to be fair, it worked for Trump in the primary. It, you know, he was able to galvanize his base. He didn't need to necessarily spend as much time as a Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis or the others in Iowa, New Hampshire and South Carolina. He could just appear at these courthouses and appear outside of the courthouse and talk to voters and everyone in the media or most media outlets would cover it and report on what he said and write about what he said. So he was getting free media. Now, he could continue to do this in the general election, but I'm not so sure how that's going to 
play with that really key suburban swing uh, constituency that him and Biden are really competing for. Um, not even just suburban, just swing voters in general, I should say. I think these voters, you know, they look at Trump's legal stuff, the Biden impeachment saga on Capitol Hill. And they view that as political noise, really, at the end of the day. What they want to hear Trump and Biden talking about is the economy, the situation at the southern border, crime, health care, kitchen table issues that impact them every day. Donald Trump's legal issues are not going to impact a voter um, on a daily basis like those other issues. So, you know, Trump is going to have to do a balancing act as he's going to be requ- he's going to re- be required to do some of these courtroom appearances. But at the same time, he wants he needs to be focused on those issues that really matter to voters. But it's not just the balancing act in the courtroom. To your point, it's also who he's going to pick as his, as his running mate. I mean, the Wall Street Journal today has a, has a piece out about whether Governor Christie Noem is ready for prime time. Should he pick Christy Noem, then he's doubling down on a conservative to to be uh, on his ticket, uh, as opposed to going a more moderate route. I think that as he approaches this cycle in 2024, Trump is seen as a conservative by the base. But would he need to pick a more moderate-leaning running mate in order to be able to compete even closer and to be able to win again Pennsylvania, which he won in 2016, but lost in 2020. I mean, does he need to pick a more moderate running mate? And who would that be uh, on the short list from the moderate perspective? Because we've heard about the conservatives who he's considering. You know, it's interesting. In 2016, Trump famously obviously picked, uh, you know, then Indiana Governor Mike Pence, by no means a moderate, but Mike Pence played a big role in helping Trump really shore up the evangelical base. Trump has that base shored up. Trump Trump has the conservative base shored up. The question is that moderate vote that you're talking about. And it's interesting because when Nikki Haley dropped out of the primary earlier this month, she said, look, Trump is going to have to work to win that 40 percent that he lost in South Carolina of Republican primary voters that are more moderate or maybe independent right leaners. And she didn't endorse him. So, you know, it's hard to see someone like a Nikki Haley potentially, you know, on a short list. Um, You know, I wouldn't necessarily call her moderate. But before the State of the Union stuff, um, you know, in the run up to the State of the Union and when it was announced that she would be given the response, Katie Britt's name was certainly floated. But look, I think Trump is someone who values loyalty really above all, and he wants someone who's going to be loyal to him. And, you know, when you look at the moderates within the Republican wing, um, you know, you look at the you don't have to look any farther than, you know, Senate leadership, for example. And I wouldn't say they're moderate, maybe they're non-Trump establishment, but, you know, they're not they they sort of do their own thing. They're not in the Trump crowd. They may endorse him, but they're not in his crowd. So it's really hard to see who he picks at this point, because everyone on the short list, for the most part, is pretty conservative. It's going to be interesting to see where Senator Tim Scott uh, falls into that uh, mix, uh, because clearly I think the the general thinking was that Trump was going to pick someone, uh, pick a female to to be on the ticket. But I think that there has been a shift uh, in terms of that thinking, at least according to the sources that I'm talking to. Speaking of running mates, RFK announcing a VP pick. Who's he picked? And what impact is this going to have on a general election and the impact that him being on the ballot in certain states could have with Trump versus Biden? Yeah, Nicole Shanahan, she's someone who I really didn't know about until the last few weeks. If you've covered tech and followed tech and really followed his campaign very closely, she has been a major donor to his campaign. Um, you know, look, she's uh, worked in tech. She's an entrepreneur based in the San Francisco Bay Area. But remember that RFK Super Bowl ad that aired yeah. um, earlier this year? She was sort of behind the funding for that ad. So she's been pushing this for a while. You know, in 2020, she was supporting Biden, Buttigieg, Marianne Williamson, sort of a plethora of Democrats throughout that primary. In 2016, she supported Hillary Clinton. But she has cash. She has a cash advantage. And if what RFK needs right now is cash and fundraising, really to get himself out there, to be able to promote his you know, campaign and you know, spread that message. So that's very important. But also uh, the point about ballot access, having a running mate will make that much easier. Now, does Nicole Shanahan 
throw a monkey wrench into this race by essentially saying, um, you know, look, it's by, you know, her being a woman, her being the running mate, does she threaten Trump or Biden's chances? I don't think so. But at the end of the day, um, not to win. I don't, not to win, but but her money impacts the race. Yeah. Her money, to, just totally echoing what you're saying and, and what my sources are telling me is their money impacts the race. I mean, if, if, if RFK Jr. performs at 4% uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, yeah, that's going to make a huge impact in terms of uh, the dynamic between Biden and Trump. If, she's, if they place at 10% in a state, as some polls have them at, uh, RFK Jr. At, at, at 10%, that definitely is going to make an impact. So, you know, I, I, I agree with you, and we talked about this off air, Julia, in, in the newsroom, that it, they're not playing necessarily to win. They're playing to no. make an impact. An and impact. what yeah. RFK Jr. did was select someone who's got a ton of cash, a ton of cash, probably could even potentially even bail out former President Donald Trump. That's how much cash uh, San Francisco and the Silicon Valley area is floating around. And so the way that this maneuvers is going to be really, really interesting because you just put it, hit the nail on the head. RFK needs money and he just got it. And his running mate. Speaking of which, uh, in, in terms of media moves, because that also dominated the media, NBC firing Ronna McDaniel, former chairwoman, of course, of the RNC, after backlash. I mean, was that the right call for NBC executives to do? I mean, I'm of the belief, and maybe I'm old school, I'm of the belief that you got to be able to hear from all sides of the political spectrum, regardless of who you believe in or what your own views are. I mean, I would have loved to have seen Rachel Maddow interview Ronna McDaniel. Let's have the public. Let's have the public discourse. I think this country is way too divided, and it's because we don't even talk to each other anymore. You know, I wasn't obviously privy to a lot of those internal conversations, but there was clearly reports of a lot of discontent and frustration, not only among some of the left-leaning opinion hosts on NBC and MSNBC, but, you know, behind uh, the scenes, you know, among staffers and such, there was, you know, a growing outcry. And I think um, this was a move by NBC uh, to essentially put out that fire as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of whether the fire was put out, we'll see uh, allegedly Ronna McDaniel is exploring legal options. Um, but I think there is the question to be asked, you know, who's, you know, who's running the show there, the C-suite or, um, you know, the, the hosts and such. And, you know, it's not just NBC on any cable news network. There's always that push and pull and that question of, you know, which direction a cable news network leans. Do they have, um, you know, weaker conservatives or stronger conservatives, weaker liberals or stronger liberals? Um, so, you know, I think it's just th th this at the end of the day um, was an unwanted story for NBC. And they tried to, uh, you know, put yeah. it out as much as they could. I remember, I don't want to date myself, but like, I think it was like 10 years ago now when I was a cub reporter at Politico and I had to cover a press conference between Bill O'Reilly. He was at Fox News at the time and uh, and John Stewart. And they here were like two ideologically opposed uh, communicators and they appeared together to debate one another, to, to, to have a, a public conversation. And it really served as a model and a template uh, in, in the public space. And, and they sold out uh, an auditorium in, in Washington, DC. People paid tickets to go hear them talk because people wanted to see uh, an example of ideologically opposed people having a conversation. And, and listen, again, not to get on the Cirilli soapbox, I think we need that more than ever in our country now. We are a sharply divided country, but we're also a closely, narrowly divided country. Just look at the House of Representatives and the, and the balance of power up there, folks, just to, to look at that. We need to listen to one another. And as journalists, we need to ask tough questions to people of all different ideological backgrounds. Switching gears, another person who just lost her job, Candace Owens, fired from the Daily Wire for anti-Semitic language. I mean, by the way, that's not silencing uh, speech or freedom of speech. That's because of anti-Semitism. But what's the fallout been, Julia Manchester, from Candace Owens' uh, departure from the Daily Wire? 
Yeah, to be honest, I really haven't been following yeah. this story much, but it's something that's obviously eye-catching to see someone who was conservative to leave such a you know far right-leaning network. Candace Owens, um, you know, is known for being you know very bombastic, um, you know, headline-making, controversial, and you know, I think her leaving um, is really sending shockwaves throughout the conservative and Hunter, media world. Hunter Biden's attorneys in Los Angeles court seeking to dismiss felony tax charges. Hunter Biden's legal woes also continuing. Yeah, continue. Uh, Hunter Biden's legal woes continuing. We're going to see that battle play out. Um, you know, I it, it, once again, it's just another update in a saga for Hunter Biden. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but it's not good news for him. And just lastly, before I let you go, the Supreme Court beginning those oral arguments uh, on the access to abortion pills and Alabama Democrats winning a special election after focusing their campaign on the IVF abortion issue. Already you're seeing how this is going to impact uh, the midterm elections and the presidential elections. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're going to see this. Um, this is a big warning sign for Republicans in particular. You're going to see Democrats continue to go on the offense to use this as, um, you know, a tool to talk about reproductive rights. You know, for so long we were talking about abortion. We still are. But the new battlefront in the battle over reproductive uh, rights is clearly IVF. So it gives us a bit of a preview going into the general election. Truly, Manchester, thanks so much for your time and breaking down all the headlines. Appreciate it. Thanks, I appreciate it. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu removing the Israeli delegation from the Middle East negotiating with Qatari officials over a ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. It comes after Netanyahu removed a delegation that was set to travel to the U.S. to meet with President Biden after the U.S. abstained from a U.N. Security Council vote that called for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. U.S. automakers are rerouting shipments after the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed earlier this week. Shipping companies say they need to reroute cargo and shipping routes as they wait for the bridge to be rebuilt and the port to reopen. Six people are presumed dead after the incident. Countdown to the eclipse is on and Americans are spending a lot of money on it. With just less than two weeks to go until the moon completely covers the sun, tourism is booming across states where the event is going to be visible. Hotels, campgrounds and rental cars are all booked up with Arkansas projecting to rake in more than $100 million. Get this, Texas tourism officials are saying that they're going to get more than $400 million because of the eclipse. Now, there are some unique ways to watch the eclipse as well. Six Flags in Texas is hosting a solar coaster. Holland America has a 22-day cruise, and even Delta Airlines has two flights scheduled for passengers to spend as much time as possible within the path of totality for the eclipse. That's awesome. The total solar eclipse is expected to bring in more than $1 billion cash to the economy. Who wants to be a millionaire? Nobody, Reg. Have you seen inflation these days? I want to be a billionaire. The Mega Millions lottery reached more than $1.13 billion with a cash value of $537.5 million. That's enough to pay former President Donald Trump's bond. It's the fifth largest jackpot in the game's history, and nobody has come forward yet to claim the prize. The ticket was sold, folks. It was sold in Jersey. And the grand prize winner has yet to call in to say that they got it. So check your numbers, especially if, you're, if you bought a ticket in Jersey recently. Would you check it? You could have more than $500 million waiting for you if you don't call in. Call in. You bought the ticket. That's it for today's Daily Debrief. My name is Kevin Cerilli. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hill's YouTube channel. And come on back here soon for the intersection between politics and policy.